And so do you. Amen. And I want to thank God. And Pastor Reeves, I always thank God for you and for your friendship, your transitional mentorship. And um, I always thank God for your friendship and your kindness to me and my family and for the fact that I know that you're free. I want to tell you today, I'm usually a tough cookie, but if I get emotional, there's something that the Lord has done and is doing. I trust God that every one of you in this congregation today is blessed, is ministered, is helped, is changed. Because that is the purpose of the Word of God. It is not enough what's happening in many churches today to turn up in church on Sunday and get an inspiring and motivating message so you can return out of church, live the life of your choice all week, and go back next Sunday for another inspiring, motivating message. That's not the purpose of the church, and it is not the purpose of the Word of God. Amen. The Word of God must change you. The Word of God must make you over, even if it happens in small increments. You must feel your inward parts being transformed. You must feel yourself being lifted up. And I'm not talking about your ego. I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm talking about what the Word of God is doing in you. And when the Word of God is doing that, as it lifts you up, your spirit becomes more lonely before God. The arrogance dies. The, the, that puffed up attitude, that chip on the shoulder is going to come off. God is going to change you by His Word. Jesus said to His disciples, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit, and their life. Let it do that to us today. Let it be spirit and life to us. Amen? Amen. I want to ask you to stand with me as we read the Word of God. And I'm going to invite you to join me in Acts chapter 18. By the way, thank you for your prayers for Sister V. She had a surgery that went much longer than originally expected. We were told it's going to take it was a very involving surgery and it was going to take between uh, three and four hours. Well, it took between five and a half and six hours. She lost a lot of blood and was exhausted for no particular reason except for the fact that she lost much blood. And we watched the hand of God upon my precious wife and we saw God was just blessing her and we thank God for the prayers. Because if you're in touch with the Spirit of God, you will know that other people in touch with the Spirit of God are praying for you and you will experience the power of those prayers. If you can't believe that now, I trust God you come to the place where you able to believe at some point. Yes. Your prayer is powerful. The prayers of others in your life are powerful. I thank God for your prayers. I thank you for praying. I have with me today a young family I love very much. They will even know how much I think about them. That young lady here together is Sister V's great niece, it's her sister's granddaughter. Uh, her late sisters, Randon, and uh, this is a precious young couple. And, you know, I met her husband. He watched me square in the eye. I like that kind of thing. Let me talk about you a little bit. First time I met him, I went to pick her up for church, and she couldn't make it anymore. She wasn't feeling right. And I walked up and stood in the building. And that young man watched me straight in the eye. I like when people watch me square in the eye. He says, hey, I've done it. He didn't take his eyes <laughs> off of my eyes. And I, I give God praise for them. They surprised me by being here today. 
I gave her a very vague piece of information, not an invitation, and I came here and I saw them. And when I came here, I'm very emotional, I want you to meet. When I came here and I saw them, it said to me that the message that God put in my spirit to speak to me to be was true, was for me. And I trust God that you understand why it says what to me. Read with me in Acts chapter 18. We want to read verse 1 through 3. And then we're going to read verse 18 and the first half of verse 19. Then we're going to read 24 to 28. When you're there, could you please say amen? Amen. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because the Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came on to them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. Take a note of the switch of the names. This everything that is in the word of God makes sense and is a work of the Holy Spirit. Having shorn his head in St. for he had a vow, and he came to Ephesus and left them there. We're going to stop there and go to verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, the mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto them the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass through a cave, <coughs> the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which have believed through grace. This man is changing on his own very nose, and not, I think he's realizing it. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and publicly, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Now, make it alive in our hearts. Change us. Let us go away from here knowing that we have been spoken to directly by the Spirit of God and change us. Change us, we ask. Just change us, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. In order to bring this message properly into perspective, I have to let you know a certain scripture when Paul was writing the Thessalonians in the second letter. There in chapter uh, 3 of 2 Thessalonians, in verse 1, he said, and I should have... Yeah. Let me, let, me, let me read it directly. I was going to just state what he said, but I'd like to read this directly. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. He asked the church at Thessal Thessalonica, he said, pray for us that the word of God may have a free course. The, the New King James Version says that the word of God may run swiftly. 
This is the objective of the church. Second to knowing Jesus and serving him, our function is to have the word of God run swiftly through our lives and through the agencies of the churches. The churches have lost their way, most of them, in our day and time. I started to make that remark. It is good for you to have good ideas about what the direction you want to see your country and your society go. That's good. But the place of the church is not in political activism. The place of the church is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for the politicians. We pray for them. I've heard you praying for the president. That's a smart thing to do. Because if you think that he's got some problems, and you pray for him, some of those problems may get fixed. What, what, what about if you, you know, whether this president or another? What about if the president of the United States of America, whether this one or another one, were to rise up before the whole nation and said, today, I confess my sins and give my heart to Jesus Christ. <coughs> And I am hoping that I can lead this country better than I am you. You and I have a responsibility to pray that the gospel we preach may run swiftly. And to run, for the gospel to run swiftly is an important thing in our day and time because the church has been losing much ground. We have been losing much ground. Could you imagine the onward, uh, the, the forward thrust of all the new age stuff, and of all the atheistic stuff, and of all the wickedness that we see all around us, it's onward and forward thrust, and the number of people that are increasing, supporting so many ungodly ideas, and spreading their influence far and wide, and we are in the church, and we are struggling among ourselves, like Paul had to deal with with the Corinthians telling them, you are saying I'm a Paul and I'm a Paulus and you have all kinds of divisions and out there there's a dying world that needs your prayer, that needs your gospel, that needs your example, that needs your help to find their way. The church is losing too much ground and it's time for us to get back on the firing line. If at the end of this message the only thing you don't remember any details but the only thing that happens to you is that you have a new resolve to engage in fighting the good fight of faith. This message would have served its purpose. Amen. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay a hold upon eternal life. Know what your purpose is. God is intending daily, not just on a single occasion, but every day to fill us again and again with the anointing, the power of his Holy Spirit to fill us with that message, to do to us like happened to Jeremiah when he said, I said to myself, after all this frustration and after all this difficulty, and one day they're going to get me eventually, I'm going to start preaching. Pastor Reeves was just telling me, he says, if God called you, you can't resist. If God called you, you can't walk away from the call of God all really nearly as you very well means. And then you see churches closing and people resigning. And not only churches closing and people resigning, but there's, listen to this carefully, there's a certain amount of influence which each man is permitted to have. Did you hear what I just said? Let me say it again. There's a certain amount of influence that every man is permitted to have. And when he goes past that stage and he's going in the wrong direction, God will shut him down. Especially in an environment where men and women of God are praying and calling upon the name of the Lord. You must understand. We have seen many people, people that we like, people that were supposed to be great, and they died, many of them died young because they had much influence and their influence got to a place where it could no longer glorify God and lead the world around them in the right direction. And God says, come. He took them out. 
I want you to understand that this is part of the call of the church of Jesus Christ. That the right influences will raise up in the right places to facilitate the spread of the gospel and the swift running. One of these days, you're going to understand more of a free course as it's, as, as it's described here. But free course in the church, a course is a, the original definition of a course was a tract of land that was prepared and designed for athletic activity. That's the idea. Of, and, and, but, but very often, it was like a, a multi, huge multi-purpose uh, a structure with grounds and everything and they would have other types of convocations and programs in it but whenever there would be an athletic meet the whole place would be cleared the lines would be set up so that the broad jumper could do his broad jump the high jumper could do his high jump the pole vaulter could do his pole vault the sprinter could do his sprint the distance runner could do his distance and every preparation was made so that all the people who had to participate could run swiftly. They were given free course. The term course was a very literal term, meaning a physical setting, an environment in which people could perform on their athletic feats. When the gospel of Jesus Christ gets free course, and that's why you pray, when the gospel of Jesus Christ gets free course, just like the broad jumper does his broad jump, the sprinter does his sprint. Every person with their ministry, every person with their gift, every person with their anointing is released by the Spirit of God because of the prayers of the saints. Your prayers release the gifts of the Spirit in the life of the servers of the Lord. And not everybody is a sprinter. Not everybody is a distance runner. Not everybody is a broad jumper. But everybody needs free course to do what God has gifted and anointed them to do. Yeah. And in that setting, the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to run swiftly and achieve its purpose in the world. That brings me to Apollos. Who was Apollos? Apollos was born in Alexandria. The Bible tells us he was born in Alexandria. Alexandria was in Egypt. Now, you've got to understand what's going on here. This is now the Greco-Roman era. But prior to this, it was the Greek Empire. And after Alexander the Great died, and the Daniel had a lot to do with this in his prophecies, if you read chapter 9, chapters 8 and 9 of Daniel, and we find the, the, the Greek uh, Empire breaking up into four parts, of which the two most powerful and most notable in history were the one in the north and the one in the south. The one in the north being Syria, Antioch, and the one in the south being Egypt, Alexandria, my real capital. And the Greek influence and the Greek culture was at such a high, you have philosophers, this is where the Old Testament was first translated from Hebrew into Greek because one of the Ptolemies, which was the Greek king, got 72 Jewish students and they were excellent students and they translated the Greek, the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And there was a lot of education, there was a lot of culture, there was a lot of prosperity. In the time that Apollos was born and raised, there was a uh, there was a Jewish philosopher named Philo. You heard the name Philo, some of you. And Philo was uh, always trying to syncretize the Jewish faith with the Greek myth. And he encouraged a lot of people to not take the laws of God too literally. Let's allegorize everything. In this environment, Apollos was born. Every attempt was being made by the Greek Empire to Hellenize the Jews. I want to tell you what Hellenizing means because it has a lot to do with you today. 
The Hellenization of the Jews. The, the, the word Hellenized or Hellenistic simply referred to the type of environment in which you were trying to subvert the thinking of people to a new culture or a new set of customs and a new set of values. These were the people who had genitalia hung along the streets. They invented some sexual practices that the world did not know before. These were the people who took the precious young ladies and made them priestesses in the, in the shrines of, uh, of Diana, uh, the goddess, the great goddess. You remember there was this big insurrection in the book of Acts with Paul and in Ephesus and they, a bunch of them got together and made noise in the city for several hours. Great is the goddess Diana of the Ephesians. What do you think they were talking about? They called those young women who were, many of them, teenagers, and they were preparing them for pre-teen stage to become prostitutes in the temple of the goddess Diana, the goddess of love and of fertility and what have you. And that is the culture in which the Jews were being Hellenized. Out of that environment came a polis. I'm saying that so that you can understand right now that your children are right now being Hellenized in school. The spirit of Hellenization is taking root in schools. It's taking root in places. You, go, you have one set of values in your home, and they have a different set of values everywhere. You send your children, and you don't know who you are dealing with. You must pray. I used to pray. Then you send your children out of your house. Lay your hands on them. Amen. Amen. I said, lay your hands Amen. on them. They're not yours. And they certainly don't belong to the institutions you're sending them to. They were given to you by God. Are you hearing me? Amen. They were given to you by Almighty God. And He has the right to shape and build and mold their lives so that they would be in a good place. The spirit of Hellenization is in the midst of us. And we got people telling our children, young and tender in age, without our permission, about different types of sexual practices and different types of acceptance of different people. You and I have that prerogative. You and I have that responsibility before God to nurture our children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. But you go and you send your children here and you send them there and they're Hellenized for you. Your children come home using language that you've never used. You say, hey, where you got that from? They look at you blankly. What's wrong? That, that was, that's supposed to be a normal word. That's supposed to be. Well, not here. But, but it happens it, it, happen, it, it happens all day, every day. They hear stuff, they see stuff, their young minds are impressionable. They are being shaped by what they see and hear. What are you going to do? Sometimes I think, Pastor, that we have forgotten to believe what Jesus teaches about heaven and hell. It seems, uh, and, and we know preachers have given up their beliefs about heaven and hell. They've given it up because it's difficult for them to stand in front of a congregation and tell that congregation that if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't repent of your sins, if you don't turn to serve the true and living God His way, you are going to go to a lost eternity. That's becoming too old-fashioned for preachers to preach. Yes. Now we've got preachers coming out plainly and saying all the different alternate lifestyles. We can't do anything about it. We have to accept all the lifestyles in the church. We have to accept everything that everybody does. I want to tell you today, right now, all the years we were preaching and telling people alcoholism is not good for you. Drunkenness is going to destroy your life and destroy your family. Adultery has no place in marriage. Yeah. We've been teaching that all the years. We've been teaching that homosexuality is a sexual deviance. We've been teaching all these things for years 
Now an army of people has risen up against us to brand us as haters because we're preaching what we've been preaching all the year. Amen. God loves you. He hates the sin. <coughs> if we are like the God we serve, we must love every person but hate the sin. Amen. And we must state quite clearly that the sin is the sin. We, we can't read it. We have no how dare we redefine the word of God? How dare we redefine the standards by which God brought us out of the world unto himself? Amen. Apollos was born. Apollos was raised in the midst of a Hellenizing influence. And the Bible says, Apollos came forth out of that place, turned up in Ephesus, mighty in the scriptures, an eloquent man who opened his mouth with every opportunity and preached the holy scriptures. How did it happen? Because the hand of God was upon him. Like the hand of God is going to be upon you. Like the hand of God is going to be upon your children. You must believe. You must stand firmly in the holy place. Amen? Amen. Love people. Love people. You know how many deviant people I know? They're deviant in one way or another. Love people. You have to love. The Bible says God is love. There's an army of people responding to hate <coughs> rhetoric with hatred. I'm going to tell you about them in a moment. Just give me a moment. I'm going to come to them. I have nothing condemning to say about any of these people. Jesus died for every one of them. Each one of them is equally entitled to the salvation that you and I have. Are you getting me? Uh, I don't care what side of the political spectrum you find yourself and what beliefs you have. Personally, let me tell you, I have avowed myself not to align myself to a political party. I want to stay in a position where I can see stuff clearly. And don't have to be biased by some group of people pulling me this way and another set yanking me that way. No, thank you. I want to keep myself free to think the way Jesus wants me to think. I want to keep myself free to love people that everybody else is hating. Because that's what a Christian is supposed to be, and that's what a Christian is supposed to do. Amen. And don't let the world, don't let the present politics of America shape what you are going to be. Let the word of God shape what you're going to be. It's the best course you can take. Are you hearing me today? Yeah, yeah. The word of God is the document of all documents. And if you pay the more earnest heed to it, it will change that verse that Pastor read. He who has an ear, and God is powerful. So that even if you walked in here with a set of preconceived notions, God right now can build an ear on you. Are you hearing me? He who has an ear. If you didn't have an ear to hear when you walked in here, I want you to know that God can build new ears on you right now. And give you the ability to hear the truth and be changed by it. Amen. Apollos rose up out of a heavenly Hellenized environment where there were Jews who had become very philosophical and were trying to fuse together those degenerate ways of the Greeks with the holy ways of the Lord. Apollos was a part of there. I'll never forget Philo. He might have even been influenced by the eloquence of Philo and the philosophical approaches of Philo. But he made up in his mind that he was not going to sell himself short of the faith of his fathers. He was not going to sell himself short of the God who called Moses and spoke to him out of a fire in a burning bush and said, I am that I am, which means I am God, I change not. God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And the most notable thing is, the bush was on fire, but the bush was not being consumed. 
I want you to understand something. The fire can be powerful enough to destroy this building in a short space of time. But we will say, as a lay person like me, the fire destroyed the building. The scientist will say, the fire fed on the fuel provided by the building. Are you getting it? And the fact that the fire was burning in the burning bush and the bush was not being consumed means that the fire was not being fed. The fire was self-contained. The fire was self-existent. It depended on nothing to make it burn. That's not normal. That had to be done. He says, I am that I have to get it now. The Hellenization process had not troubled Apollos. He came forth as pure gold. He must have had many challenges. He must have had much persecution. The last time I came here, I remember telling you about how they conscripted these young Jews and had them in these same amphitheaters, training them to be athletes, training them, that kind of stuff. And the young Greek guys, they always trained and did all their physical regimes. They were totally naked from head to toe. And when they saw the young Jewish fellows and that they were circumcised, they said, why are you spoiling such a beautiful body? I could imagine Apollos saying to them, this body belongs to God. And he wants that mark. That's his stamp of approval upon my life. That's his stamp of authority. Could you imagine it? Apollos was a lot like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He came forth unscathed. I say to this church today, Apollos, come forth. I say to this church today, how many of you have children? I want you to raise your hands. How many of you, you have children? All right, you raise your hands. Keep your hands up. I'm doing something. You have children. Now, those of you whose children are adults over 24, you can put your hands down. You have young, impressionable children still. And I want you to understand, those of you who have your hands raised, I want you to take the same hands that are raised, and then you go poor, join them with the other hand, and get on your knees in the privacy of the your spouse, if your spouse is in spiritual agreement with you, and raise those hands to heaven, and call upon the name of the Lord for your children, because the world in which you live is getting worse every day. Yes. And you have no yes. idea what that child yes. concerning you. Amen. You have such great and grandiose ideas for the future. Yes. You don't have any idea what they're going to be yes. in a messed up place like this. I speak for the spirit of the Apollos in your children. I speak it now in the name of Jesus. Apollos, come forth. And Apollos came forward. When he came, what did he have? The Bible says he was eloquent. He was a brilliant man. He was very knowledgeable in the scriptures. Bearing in mind that at that time the scriptures were from Genesis to Malachi. Alright? And then the Bible says he was baptized in the baptism of John. So what did he know? He knew of the coming Messiah. He knew the Messiah had come. He knew that the Messiah was to be followed and that he wanted to be a good disciple of the Messiah. He was teaching the Jews and he was teaching amongst the Jews that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He was doing that effectively. What he did not understand up to that point was the full definition of grace as Paul taught it. Paul said the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. The power of grace was not a part of Apollos' acumen of knowledge. The power of the Holy Spirit as he was poured out on the day of Pentecost, giving gifts that made people extraordinary and made them powerful in the service of God was not a part of Apollos' acumen of knowledge. 
The grace by which Paul the Apostle himself in 1 Corinthians 15 says, I was one of those apostles born out of Jew time and I have no business being an apostle. My background makes me unworthy, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I rose up and I labored more abundantly than every apostle, yet not me, but the grace of God that is in me. That was not a part of a power's acumen of knowledge. Are you getting me today? Yeah. Uh, with all that Apollos knew, with all his conviction, with all his strength, with all his fervency, with all his giftedness, Apollos turned up and upstaged everybody. But he did not know some things that he needed to know. He did not have some things he needed to have. And the scripture says there were two people whose names were Aquila and Priscilla. We are not told where Priscilla was born, but Aquila, her husband, was born in Pontus of Galatia. The two places where Apollos was born and where uh, 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 Aquila was born were like the two opposite extremes of the then known world around the Trans-Mediterranean region. God brought those two people together because God will do things like that. Are you hearing me? One of the things you want to learn in life is that God will bring you into contact with some of the most unlikely people. And when you meet them, don't just brush them aside. A lot of people miss their blessing by brushing aside somebody who didn't look worth two cents. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Paul found Aquila and Priscilla, not in Pontus of Galatia, but they had been raised up. They were Jews. And I'm sure they went through some of what Apollos went through. But at an earlier stage, it's very likely that they were older people. It's very likely that they were in the faith of Christ before. Tradition has it that Aquila might have been one of the 70 that Jesus sent out. But one of the things you have to understand is that even though these people lived, they were in the dispersion outside of what we know as Palestine or the region of Israel, they came home several times a year for, for different types of convocations. In fact, the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts, for those of you who don't understand it, the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts speak the stories of a group of people who were fractured and who were out of their place because many of them came home for holy convocations and the gospel got a hold of them, saved them, those 3,000 people that got baptized on the day of Pentecost, the vast majority of them were not living in Israel. They came from, I checked the list, they were like about 15 different lands, from a minimum of 15 different lands from which those people came. But when they came, the Holy Spirit got a hold of them and transformed them. And then the group went to 5,000. Then more thousands kept being added to the Lord. And every time the people got added to the Lord, they got stuck in Jerusalem. And that is the reason why rich people were given such big, generous gifts to take care of people who left their hometowns, who left their home countries, <coughs> and got stuck in Jerusalem because the Spirit of them, God compelled them to stay after they got saved. They were out of their comfort zone. They were economically fractured. They would have been homeless if the Christians didn't house them. They would be without food. And that's the reason why you have stories like in Acts where Peter said it is not worthwhile for us to leave the Word of God and serve tables. There are so many people. We've got to stay in the Word of God. We've got to stay in prayer to feed the church. Get some deacons and let them do this business. We can't do this and pray enough and study enough and preach enough and teach enough. Because there were a number of displaced people and they were in the thousands. That is one of the things that the Spirit of God did to rectify the Hellenizing influence. But you have got to pray. The Bible says they were praying. They were in one place. They were in one accord. And they were praying. You need to pray that God would use a wide range of methods 
to break this and stem the tide of the hellenizing influences that are around you. Aquila rose up with great might, married his wife, Priscilla. And the, of the six times, listen to this because it's very significant, of the six times Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned in scripture, three of those six times Priscilla was mentioned before Aquila. Now that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Did you get it? Never was a man, a woman named before a man in tradition. But Paul the Apostle says, you are co-heirs, you are joint heirs of the gift of salvation. So I call forth the Priscilla's. Priscilla, rise up, come forth, and do the bidding of Almighty God. Priscilla, don't sell yourself short. Priscilla, don't sell yourself cheap. Priscilla, stay faithful to the Lord, and God will be faithful to you. Priscilla, rise up in your strength, and serve God and see victory. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and see your victories. Priscilla, stand your ground. Amen. Who is a Priscilla in here today? Amen. Who? Who is a Priscilla? The Priscilla in the Bible had a husband. And the fact that her name was mentioned three times, of the six times it mentioned before her husband, tells me two things. They had very individual giftings, and they were each one. Apart from the fact that they were married and they were a team under the hand of God, they had individual giftings, and each one of them had individual and outstanding anointings and outpourings upon their individual lives. That's one of the things it tells me. Another thing it strongly suggests to me is that Priscilla might have been of superior breeding and culture than her husband. And might have actually known her might have been a more educated person. Be that as it may, this is the work of the Holy Spirit, taking these people and bringing them together. When Aquila and Priscilla heard Apollos, they listened to him, and they didn't only hear what he had, they heard what he didn't have. And they said, this man has too much potential has too much gifting, has too much fervency, has too much influence for us to leave him like this. If we can equip him better, he can be a greater man for the glory of God. We're going to do this. And they got a hold of Apollos, brought him into their home. By the way, Aquila and Priscilla, more than once, and in more than one place, had a church in their house. All right? And when they were then Paul met them, they had just been expelled from Rome because they were evangelizing in Rome. They were doing the service of God. They were itinerant. They were not frontline preachers, but there are those people who get mentioned less but do more. You know some of them? If you get mentioned less and do more in this church or anywhere else you are, quit trying to ring bells over what you do. As long as God sees it and God puts his stamp of approval upon it, it's going to prosper for the glory of God. Yes. Stand your ground. Be faithful. The ultimate objective of this message is that you and I must be so ready to war a good warfare for the glory of God and so prayerful that through your life, through this church, I pray God that this church never for any reason becomes like many other churches I'm seeing right now. May God keep this church. May the Apollos rise up in this church. May the Aquilas and Priscilla rise up in this church and be full of the power of the Holy Spirit, be full of the gifts in the Spirit and be mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen. Pastor kept encouraging me, don't worry about the numbers. Look at the need. That's right. From the time the Lord dropped this message in my spirit, I did not, the only person I conferred with almost immediately was Pastor. Are you yeah. hearing me? Yeah. And, and I did not kill. He says, we're going to postpone it for a week because I forgot I had invited somebody to speak for us. I said, I don't know. If it 
took me for the next few months before I came here. I was confident that God would let me speak this message at the right time to the right people. I didn't know who was going to be here, and it didn't bother me. I didn't know how many people were going to be here, and it didn't bother me. All I'm saying to you, if you sense that there's an apostle spirit in you, walk away from the heavenizing influences and stand in the holy place. If you sense that there is a spirit of Aquila and Priscilla in you to minister to others, don't worry about people who come in this church and seem more gifted than you. And they just turn up recently and their name is getting called in the pulpit more often than mine. And I've been here for years, slaving myself, slaving myself, slaving and slaving, and nobody seems to appreciate it. Who is that? The spirit of Aquila and Priscilla does not function like that. The spirit of Aquila and Priscilla will pull that heart over and will say to that precious man, this is what the Lord wants me to tell you because this is what the Lord wants you to know. And if you pay the whole earnest thing to this, you will be greater. Imagine if they're pushing the greatness of somebody to their own exclusion. That's the spirit of Aquila and Priscilla. Do I have an Aquila in here? Do I have a Priscilla in here? Aquila come forth. Priscilla come forth and walk in the power of the spirit of the living God. Amen. Amen. It is time, church. It is time that we realize that all the <clears throat> things that the world has pushed at us for many years are not the values of the scripture, are not the values of the Lord. The Bible says if you humble yourself in the sight of God, in due time he will lift you up. And there are going to be a lot of people coming through here. They're outstanding. They're gifted. They're going to upstage you. Not the, I did not say that before you test them and before you know what they're worth, you just give them a pass. No. A, 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 a pass was listened to carefully and I'm sure they didn't hear him one time. They listened to him. And I'm sure they didn't talk to him one time. They pulled him over and they spoke with him on several occasions. They sounded him up. They prepared him. And when they had prepared him, the next thing the Bible tells me, he was disposed to go to Corinth. Then Apollos was a Jew preaching to Jews. Everywhere he went, he looked for Jews to try and prove to them that these scriptures that we read point out that Jesus is the Christ. Do you know that the Bible tells us, read the scripture, and it says that Apollos now was changed because now he started to minister to people whom he recognized as having been saved by grace. This is where the common ground is. Paul preaches it. He says both the Jew and the Greek start at the same point. God is going to save you by grace to the exclusion of the law. God is going to save you by grace to the exclusion of the rituals. God is going to save you by grace to the exclusion of the formality of circumcision. God is going to save you by grace and his grace is going to fill you with power and potency to serve God in a mighty way. Amen. A policy was changed. And when he was changed, he preached to the Gentiles. And the Bible says he preached to the Gentiles and built them up in the faith on the basis of the grace of God. It's right here in the scripture. And then he went outside into the synagogues and he publicly convinced the Jews from the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. But before that, he had... Aquila and Priscilla. Let me tell you this in closing. For every for every Apollos, there's going to be an Aquila and a Priscilla. And if you're the Apollos, you're going to need an Aquila and Priscilla. And trust me, if you're an Aquila or a Priscilla, you're going to need an Apollos. When you pray, ask God to bring you into contact with the right people of His choosing. And when you pray, remember that Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So when you come into contact with the right person, don't say, God sent you to bless me. No. 
Let be the theme of your heart. God sent you so he could bless you. And you need more to show them than to receive it. Did you hear that? Did you know that if you have the nature of Christ in you, you have been given the power to love. And that's the reason why John says, For everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Take this and run with it. Apollos, come forth. Aquila, come forth. Priscilla, come forth. The last thing I want to say to you is this. We have a lot of young people and young adults right now who are very active. They're out there. They go from state to state. They raise many protests. They carry black cards. And they're passionate. Many of them are well educated. They're passionate. I do not condemn them. I say to you concerning them to be that from among them, God must raise up a people for himself. Did you hear me? From among those savior, the radicals, many of them are off the deep end about some political idea. I want you to know that God has a people among them. Don't ever look at a group of people and condemn them out of hand. Because even if they're doing everything wrong so far as your assessment goes, there's a people among them for them. And when he raises them and he brings them out, he may bring them to you, Aquila. He may bring them to you, Priscilla. Don't allow your mind to be blocked by the fact that they belong to a different race, a different political party, or a different set of beliefs or values from what you have. If you're chosen by God, and that person is chosen by God, there's going to be sufficient common ground for you to bless each other. Do you believe what I'm saying? Stand firm in the place of prayer. Because when God sends people into this congregation, they might be different. They might be different. They might be very different. But stand your ground and ready yourself to minister. Because God is equipping some people outside of the church right now, but they're going to be a part of the church. And those are the people because the people from the traditional church have lost so much ground and have lost the ability to evangelize the world. And we got a bunch of millennials who speak a slightly different language anyway. Their thinking is different, their expression is different, their style of communication is different. Who do you think is going to reach them? When you and I can't reach them, who do you think is going to reach them? A lot of those same young people that you think are crazy, a lot of those same young people who are right now burning somewhere or helping some stones into some uh, glass storefront. Those are the people God is going to raise them. And when he raises them up, you know where he's going to send them? He's going to send them to you if you're faithful to God. Because every apparatus needs an appeal or a message. Every Paul needed a Barnabas. Are you hearing me? Every Paul needed a Barnabas. Every Elisha needed an Elijah. Every Apollos needed an Aquila and a Priscilla. And last but not least, how many of you have heard the name you know the from the Bible? If you heard the name, raise your hand. You know the name. You heard the name Sintaiki? Yeah. Paul said, I beseech you, yeah. Odia and Sintaiki, that they speak the same things. And then what did he say? I beseech you through your fellow. Help those women which labor with me in the gospel. And every Odia and every Sintaiki is going to need a strong, stable, faithful man of God in that congregation that can provide them with grounding and perspective. I say to you today, church, rise up and prosper. Fight the good fight of faith. Let nothing, nothing, no canonizing it. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I know young people who were afraid to get children. They were afraid to have children. They said, Uncle, I don't want to have a child. I, I, I want to have a child, but I don't want to have children. I'm seeing what is happening. I counsel them, 
I laid my hands on them. You know two of them because they were here a few months ago. And they had their two doctors. Those people were totally afraid to have children. Now they don't be afraid. You must be in the world. The world needs the people that you produce. Are you hearing this? The world needs the people that you, if you're a Christian, and if you're walking in the world, and if you're walking in the spirit, the world needs the people that you produce. They will be the light of the world. They will be the salt of the earth. When you're gone, the legacy is going to live on in the world. Thank you. Amen.